Humans are inherently driven by emotion, but one of the strongest emotions that people have is empathy. But that empathy is a double-edged sword, as on one hand it can allow us to nurture and care for others, what happens when you're trying to nurture and care for someone that doesn't think twice about you and neglects you entirely? The world eaters are a perfect example of this phenomena, and are a prime example showing how empathy coming from a good place and their experiences and interactions with the person they try to help, leaving them scarred and entirely unrecognizable. The Legion itself began as the Warhounds, and over time this Legion would develop a pretty strong reputation, being considered alongside the early Blood Angels to be, let's just say, problematic. They would take no prisoners, destroy everything in their path, often shouting their war cry, Blood for the Primarch, Skulls for the 12th Legion. This Legion was so unbelievably violent that rumors began to spread rapidly that, in the heat of battle, they would lose themselves and not only take out the enemy, but their allies as well, with gleeful and reckless abandon. Most of this reputation was earned by the Warhounds contingent as a part of the 13th Expeditionary Fleet, which would go on to be known as the Bloody 13th amongst their fellow Astartes, allies, and the Imperial Navy and Army personnel. Admittedly, much of this has been exaggerated. They did not kill their allies and did not act like brainless idiots. In fact, the Legion before their reunification with their Primarch had a very strong warrior culture. They prided themselves on strong discipline. Officers were promoted based on skill rather than political posturing. And overall, the Legion itself had a very might-makes-right outlook on things. This does not mean that they lacked higher thinking. Far from it, actually. They actually had several commanders that would go on to be considered heroes of the Great Crusade, Karn of the Eighth Company being the most notable example. But as the Legion was reunited with their Primarch, this would fundamentally change. The Warhounds in and of themselves were loyal. They would follow anyone into the deepest, darkest pit of hell if they had the Legion's respect or trust. And unfortunately for them, their Primarch was not deserving of either. Angron is a fundamentally broken man. Even before the Butcher's Nails, Angron was a victim of circumstance and subjected the things that I would not wish on my own worst enemy. Angron was raised on the planet of Duceria as a gladiator slave. He would fight in the pits of the planet for decades, becoming the most famous gladiator that planet had ever seen. He was a kind, empathetic, and well-meaning individual. He prided himself on discipline, trust, and honor. He believed in strength and the willingness to use that strength the right way. And these aspects make him sound exactly like the Warhounds that were rampaging throughout the galaxy at the time. However, that is not the Angron that they met. They did not meet Angron the Gladiator King, but Angron the Eater of Cities. And this is mostly in part to two things. The way the Emperor summoned him to join the Crusade, and the Butcher's Nails. When Angron and his fellow Gladiators broke out of their cages and started to rampage the Nusarian capital, completely destroying it in 31 Terran Standard Hours, or one Nusarian day, they were trapped on the top of a mountain, facing off against the armies of aristocrats that he and his fellow gladiators would call High Riders. They were fully prepared to die, and him and his gladiator brethren would die happy. But before this could happen, the Emperor of Mankind would appear before Angron, telling him of his true origins and asking him to take Twelfth Legion as his sons and fight in the Great Crusade. Angron said no. He wanted to fight and die against the tyranny of the High Riders with his gladiatorial allies, and that was that. So the Emperor, not taking no for an answer, stole him from the death that he had earned so many times over, and was forced to watch as his brothers and sisters he dearly loved get butchered and maimed by the people that completely tortured him emotionally and physically. And this is where the Butcher's Nails come into play. Because the Butcher's Nails are an archaic implant that is barbaric, to say the least. What it does, when installed into someone's brain, it completely rewires it, making the user into someone that feels excruciating pain when not feeling extreme amounts of anger or rage. And whenever a gladiator got too overzealous, the Nusarian High Riders would install them in order to keep the gladiators in line. So when you have someone like a Primarch, who has inherent leadership skills, charisma, and is unnaturally strong, you turn a pure specimen of genetic perfection already capable of waging war into the closest thing to a tornado of violence possible. But easily the most dangerous thing about the Butcher's Nails is the fact it completely negates any real higher brain function, making the individual unable to sleep or even truly think. It is a truly horrifying way to live. So, with all of this in mind, Angron, a man already capable of unspeakable violence, 
even when he was a better, well-rounded, and actual functional person, was deemed so dangerous that Eldar assassins tried to kill him as a baby to prevent the bloodshed that would follow him in his future, and would fail, had implants put in his brain that made him even more capable of said violence, and now you steal him away from the only family he has ever known to serve the same type of tyrant he spent years enslaved by, and now you want him to go fight for you and tell him that if he won't be his son, that him just being a ghost will suffice? And you expect him to respond to this in a favorable manner? Needless to say, Angron was beyond enraged. And despite the Legion's warm welcome, every time a Legionary would attempt to meet their Primarch, he would just kill them. For days this went on, and the only man left standing was Karn of the Eighth. And after Karn let Angron brutalize him, with Angron screaming at him to fight back, Karn refused. To him, Angron was his father, and he would not lay a hand on the man that he had spent an entire crusade trying to honor. This would actually win Angron over, and as a result, Karn would become Angron's right-hand man. And after this, Angron would declare the Legion no longer the Emperor's Warhounds. They would no longer be the obedient tool that the Emperor desired. No, they would be the Eaters of Worlds. And after this, we would see a marked shift in the Legion, because from this point on, the World Eaters would be almost entirely different from their pre-Primark reunification counterparts. Unlike most of the Legions, the now World Eaters did not adopt their Primarch's homeworld as their new muster planet. That remained the world of Bot. But the important thing about this is the fact that the World Eaters did not take basically anything from either Bot's or Nuceria's culture, and this is by design. Angron did not pass much of anything onto the Legion in regards to his time on Nuceria. Any of the planet's larger culture, atmosphere, teachings, Angron didn't pass any of that on because the only things that he did were really combat related. The aspect of chaining one's weapon to one's wrist was a common practice adopted from the Gladiator Pits, one that became so prominent within the World Eaters that it would spread to other Space Marine Legions, most notably to Sigismund and the Imperial Fists, alongside some members of the Blood Angels. Angron would install gladiator pits into every single ship, as any sort of disagreements within the Legion would be solved through trial by combat. But the last thing that Angron would pass on to them culturally was the Triumph Rope, a practice that would involve cutting oneself and either letting it heal into a red scar, meaning a victory, or rubbing dirt into it, making it black and signifying defeat. These are the only things that Angron added to the Legion early on just what could be considered by many as combat gimmicks. In essence, the Legion's cultural beliefs and ideas were not the ones that changed, as from a cultural standpoint, they were basically orphans. Even Legions, like say the Night Lords, as barbaric and violent as they were, still had a heavy Nostroman influence within their Legion's culture. So this action of Angron not giving the World Eaters a larger identity past the one it already had, was either him being careless, or feeling like the Legion itself was not worthy of anything better. Which brings me to my next point. Angron himself is not a Primarch. Oh sure, he may look like one, maybe as big as one, but he doesn't feel like a Primarch. And I'm not saying character-wise, I'm saying literally, he does not feel like a Primarch. Because Primarchs historically, regardless of which one you face, even if they are a demon, give off a commanding presence, which makes mortals instinctively want to fall to their knees in either reverence, fear, respect, or awe. And it's often a strong mixture of both. Angron surely inspired fear, but that is truly all he ever inspired. Because when Angron met his legion, sure they kneeled, but even Karn later on would admit to his friend Argel Tal during the Shadow Crusade that he didn't react to Angron the way he instinctively reacted to, say, Horus, Dorne, or even Lorgar. Combined with the fact that Angron basically saw himself as a dead man walking, with his Jean sons being little more than weapons to be discarded instead of sons to lead, the Legion itself, despite having a Primarch, is basically just orphaned. And to this day, mostly still are. And the reason why I think this brings me back to the topic of the Butcher's Nails. Something about the nails is disrupting Angron's natural Primarch aura. Even the Emperor in Malkador made a comment 
that this version of the nails are doing a lot more to Angron than just inflicting constant pain and anguish into him. And yes, I say this version, because the Butcher's Nails installed into the Legionaries are very different reverse engineered variants of the nails created by the Legion itself, and arguably the Butcher's Nails being installed into the Legionaries would be the largest change that Angron would bring to the Legion as a whole. Because right up until the nails were installed, Angron was fully ready to massacre his Legion due to the fact he saw them as complete failures. Despite the fact that they were some of the most skilled combatants in the Imperium, if they did not bring a planet to compliance in one Nusarian day, he would basically reprimand the Legion and punish them. And after one too many failures, Angron declared decimation for the Legion, with him desiring one-tenth of the Legion to die at the hands of their brothers. This did not pan out, as the defiance of the Legion in the face of this barbaric action put Angron into such a rage that it took 20 librarians to subdue him. But after a period of time, the nails that were being long experimented with were perfected, and the first person to get them installed was naturally Karn. After this, with several Legionaries having the nails installed, the Legion would descend on the world of Gehenna, scorching the world in bloodlust and such decadence that it would go from being called a compliance to a massacre. The nails and its biting and tickling pain in the mind of the Legionaries and the ticks and spasms that it caused would completely warp the mind of those that had them. They would break ranks, completely abandoning the phalanx-style tactics they were known for up until this point, having each member of the Legion being little more than a mindless berserker running around with a chain axe and a bolt pistol, engaging in the most brutal form of close quarters combat possible. Now, why would they do this? Why would they subject themselves to such pain and self-mutilation? Because, to the Legionaries, it made them closer to Angron. Angron, keep in mind, like I said before, saw the Legion itself as unworthy, and this, in their minds, brought them closer to the ideal the Primarch held more than anything else. So, while to many this action was considered barbaric, the Legion itself considered it to be the best possible option to be the sons of Angron they wanted to be. And it worked. For the first time, Angron regarded his Legion with some actual modicum of respect in the eyes of the father they revered so much. However, after a series of compliances during which the news of the nails being installed would reach all the way back to Terra, Lehman Russ and his Space Wolves would surround the Legion, and Angron and his Legion would fight the Wolves to a standstill, at least in their minds. In reality, the Wolves and Lehman let the World Eaters off the hook. The Emperor had no such desires. He would take the Legion out of the Crusade for a time, and had Horus practically babysit Angron and the rest of the Legion, but it was around this time when Horus would be corrupted with the Anathame Blade, and this attempt by the Emperor to actually try to rehabilitate Angron, or at least get him under control, would prove to be a massive mistake, as Angron was one of the first Primarchs to actually throw in with Horus to commit treason. So when it came time for Istvan, the Legion itself was more than prepared. Despite the failure of the virus bombing, they would engage the Loyalists in close combat, most of whom were World Eaters still loyal to the throne. But despite that, the advancing World Eaters would attack the Loyalists with such ferocity and violence that even those on the receiving end of it who had fought alongside the World Eaters never truly comprehended up until this point how devastatingly violent they were. Even Garvia Loken could barely hold his own in a duel against Karn, who at that point had been fully consumed by the nails. But the Dropsite Massacre was something else to behold, as the Legion itself would decimate the Raven Guard, drawing such ire from the Chapter and its successors that they would make a point of taking out World Eaters' warbands whenever they could, even thousands of years later. But after this, their main claim to fame during the Horus Heresy would come to pass, as their campaign in the Ultramar Sector alongside the Word Bearers would see some of the most brutal fighting that the galaxy had ever seen. But there is another problem popping up that was something that everyone was aware of, but no one really wanted to discuss. The Butcher's Nails were killing Angron, and unfortunately, this made him even more violent and erratic than he already was. So, when the Shadow Crusade made it to the world of Nuceria, Lorgar promising his brother Primarch that the world itself was key to saving him, Angron would get a particularly rude awakening. Inside of the throne room of the capital city on Nuceria, Angron learned that Angron was not revered as the Eater of Cities. He was considered a coward. As to them, he just ran off and left his brothers and sisters to die. This pushed Angron off the deep end, and had a genuine nervous breakdown that resulted in him ordering the entire planet to be cleansed, not brought to compliance or held, but for every single person on the planet to die. So the World Eaters went to work, drenching the world in blood over the course of the next 31 hours. The Ultramarines would arrive in force in response to this, 
Angron and Rabute Gilliman would duel, while Lorgar would continue to chant and pray, all the while taking advantage of the endless amounts of blood being spilt during the battle. The sky would begin to rain blood, the warp would begin to scream, and Angron would begin to feel the power of chaos poured into him through Lorgar. Angron was now no longer a Primarch, but a demon, an equerry of the blood god Khorne, and now that nails were no longer killing him, he was solely devoted to letting the blood flow and collecting skulls for his patron god. They would mindlessly run rampant after this point, and for a time they were little more than an army of mindless savage beasts, annihilating worlds wherever they could find them, even attacking fellow traitors at times. But when Horus gave the muster call for everyone to assemble at Ulanor, Pertrabo and his iron warriors would wrangle the legion like a dog and drag them back to Ulanor to march to Terra itself. On Terra, the World Eaters would savagely assault the walls of the palace, all the while Angron was kept prisoner inside of the bowels of the Night Lord's flagship, an emergency measure taken by the staff of the Conqueror, particularly its captain Latara Sarin, after Angron kept killing so many of the ship's crew that it made it almost impossible to run. But after the psychic barriers of the palace were broken, Angron would be let loose onto the surface, claiming whole seas of blood and mountains of skulls for corn, until he was stopped by Sanguinius, a fight that he would lose, as for the first time Angron would die, being banished back to the warp for the rest of the siege. The soft form of cohesion Angron brought was completely gone by this point, with the Cornate Berserkers of the Legion now left to stalk the walls and fields of the dead, acting more as wild animals than the cunning legionaries of old. The Nails and Korn's blessing fully taking them in the mindless slaughter and reality-bending warfare that the siege had turned into. Despite Korn's efforts to rally the Legion and make a push, even him, despite his strong will, would lose himself during the siege, only being what was thought to be killed by his old friend, Sigismund. The Legion after this would retreat after the siege failed. With Angron gone and Karn in a coma, the Legion was left without leadership. For a time, they would act as separate warbands, the fear of many Legionaries being that the Legion itself was gone, and that they would be destined to act as more marauding pirates and savages rather than soldiers in an army. Some would try to consolidate power, others were just enthralled by Korn's blessings and completely devolved to that power. But despite their allegiance, they would not chant Blood for the Blood God, but their old battle cry of Blood for the Primarch skulls for the 12th legion, but despite this last ditch effort to maintain some semblance of normalcy, it would not last for long. Karn would awake from his coma, foiling an assassination attempt on his life, and would lead the legion during the battle of Scalathrax against the emperor's children. But this last hurrah for the legion, a guiding war and a battle cry for them to actually maintain something better, would be lost forever, as the nails would take Karn and he would lose himself due to the cowardice that his allies showed burning those he'd spent the last 200 years fighting alongside with a flamer, and massacring the Emperor's children on the world to a man. And after this, the future that so many feared would come to pass, and despite Angron's return, by then it was far too late. To those who did not join the Black Legion, Red Corsairs, or other more organized Chaos Warbands, those still committed to the Nails would be roaming groups of savages, most of them forgetting who they are, or what they are, why they're even fighting, and never truly able to come out of the rage-induced state because of the nails. Many lose their mental faculties entirely, unable to actually comprehend any higher concepts, and are little more than walking in a waking nightmare of bloodlust and violence. All of this in an attempt to gain acceptance by a father that was never deserving of their love or reverence in the first place. Make no mistake, the World Eaters are an orphaned legion, led by a man without a father, and left with nothing other than the rage they harnessed to please that man that they never could truly serve. If they had rejected the Nails, if they stood their ground and realized the danger that it posed, they could have stopped it. They tried, but they failed. They could have found a new identity and meaning for themselves without Angron, to create a new culture and a new legacy that can make them whole, and find and give them the purpose that they so desperately needed but instead they walked the Eightfold Path, fully devoted to Korn and Angron, and as a result, the identity they once had, identity that was the perfect place to truly grow and mature, was lost in a cloud of blood and fire. They did not gain the strength or higher purpose they delude themselves into believing, merely decadence and butchery under the guise of a new destiny. Behind all the blood, skulls, and screaming, the World Eaters were a legion of men without a father crying out into the void for acceptance by a person that did not consider them sons until they had to mutilate themselves to do so. They were not Eaters of Worlds. They aren't even Warhounds. They're now just rabid dogs, one that can only see and think of two things. Blood for the Blood God, and Skulls for the Skull Throne. If you want to learn more about the World Eaters, 
Then here's a long reading list. Betrayer, Angron, Slave of Nuceria, Slaves of Darkness, Echoes of Eternity, Karn, Eater of Worlds, the 9th edition Codex, World Eaters, Warhawk, and Angron, the Red Angel. These books are wonderful, and all of them give a really good look into the Legion itself, and is a great place to start. Also, the audio drama Chosen of Corn is really good. Uh, also, listen to Butcher's Nails as well. Both of those are actually really good, and I highly recommend them. Thank you all very much for watching. If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a member, and thank you very much to the channel members. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you all very much for watching. Have a great night.